record button here. So we're recording now, just so you know. Um, well, I guess I would like you to, I would like to welcome you to the halfway point of our senior experience talks. I'm going to say this twice in both talk 10 and talk 11 of our series because I don't really know which one is the halfway point. I guess after 10 would be, but whatever. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity that all our seniors are having to share their work even in this um, different system, this different format. And I really appreciate all of you guys taking the time to join us and participate in this wonderful opportunity for them to share their research. Um, we have two more talks this week, which will be um, Larissa and Victor going at 310 and four o'clock respectively on Friday. We then will have four talks in week eight and four more talks in week nine, which I will be sure to provide you with the information on how to get those um, meetings to the majors list, to the faculty list. And if you're in 680, you already have that information. So um, join us for any of those talks. And if you don't know how to get to them, talk to me and I will get you there. I'm gonna pass off introductions um, for Hallie, even though I would also love to do it. I'm gonna pass it off to Stefan to give um, Hallie's introduction and take it away, Stefan. Sure, so it is my pleasure to introduce Hallie Sogan. So uh, Hallie's a biochemistry major coming from St. Paul, the hardest luck saint of them all, um, as the, the hold steady would, would, would say. So, um, Hallie has, has taken a lot of chemistry and a lot of biology and, and some neuroscience as well. And we've been working uh, probably almost over a year now to really um, think about how we can, uh, how she can kind of corral her very broad skill set uh, into this interesting question about ketamine. Um, and it's always nice when we can have one of these senior experience talks that sort of starts with, it would be cool if we know it, and then really, really digs down into um, some pretty hardcore primary literature and some pretty uh, high concept methodology. So I was really, I was, I was really gratified to see this talk come together. I think it's, I, I know it's going to be a good one and let's hear it. Go ahead, Allie. Alrighty. Well, thank you, Stefan. Um, so the title of my talk today is Ketamine from Street Drug to Effective Antidepressant. And so I will be going through some of the current literature about a drug called ketamine and its potential use as an antidepressant. So for starters, we need to know what exactly depression is. So in psychology, the Di Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is a tool used by professionals to diagnose individuals with various mental health disorders, including depression. So for an individual to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, they need to have at least five symptoms for a period of two consecutive weeks. So some of these symptoms <clears throat> include a depressed mood, anhedonia, which is not enjoying activities we previously did enjoy, um, changes in sleep patterns, changes in cognitive functioning, and changes in appetite. And so with that, the lifetime prevalence in the United States is 15% to 20%, which means that about one in five people suffer from depression. So this is relatively high, but it is consistent with the World Health Organization, which states that depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide. So in addition to these clinical effects that we see of depression, there's also biological and chemical differences in someone who has depression compared to someone who does not have depression. So before I talk a bit about these differences, we need to have a basic understanding of some of the brain structures involved. So here are neurons and synapses. And our bodies are made up of many cells, and neurons are the type of cell that are found in the nervous system, including the brain. So key characteristics of the neuron include the dendrites, the axon, and the axon terminals. So the dendrites here on this postsynaptic neuron would receive information from the presynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron would have information travel down its axon to the postsynaptic or to the axon terminals and then transferred to the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. And that's what's considered the, the synapse. 
So the synapse is then composed of the presynaptic axon terminal, the synaptic cleft, and the, a small area of the postsynaptic dendrite. And so this information that I'm talking about is where these green triangles and little circles come into play. So we have neurotransmitters and receptors that are responsible for this um, information transfer. So neurotransmitters are chemicals that travel across the synapse to deliver the information. And to be received by the postsynaptic neuron, the neurotransmitter needs to bind to receptors. So something like this. Um, so once the receptor is bound, or once the neurotransmitter is bound to its receptor, it activates the receptor so that the receptor will open up and allow an influx and efflux of various ions. So this depolarizes the inside of the neuron, which then allows the signal carried by the neurotransmitter to continue down the postsynaptic neuron axon. So how does this relate to depression? Well, I mentioned that there are these biological and chemical differences in someone with depression compared to someone without depression. And so these differences contribute to theories about the pathophysiology of depression. And the prevailing theory of the pathophysiology then is what's called the monoamine hypothesis of depression. So these are monoamine neurotransmitters which are just one class of neurotransmitters to exist. Um, and the reason that they're called these monoamine neurotransmitters is because they contain a two carbon side chain with an amino group seen here. So each of these neurotransmitters are then involved in signaling that are related to various functions. So for example, serotonin is involved in regulating hunger and anxiety. Norepinephrine is involved in uh, arousal and consolidation of memories of emotional experiences. And dopamine regulates behavior and is involved in the reward system. So based on the functions of these monoamine neurotransmitters, we, the monoamine hypothesis of depression then states that people with depression have reduced concentrations of these neurotransmitters compared to healthy individuals. So, for example, one symptom of depression that I mentioned was not enjoying activities that you previously did enjoy. And so this might relate to dopamine's function in the reward system, and that if a person has lower concentrations, according to this theory, then they might not experience pleasure in that particular activity. So what might this look like? So here we have our presynaptic neuron in orange and our postsynaptic neuron in blue. And we're going to go with the example of serotonin as our neurotransmitter and its respective receptor. So serotonin is then stored in these pink circles called vesicles. Um, and then these purple ovals are reuptake transporters, which are proteins that sit on the nerve terminal and remove extracellular serotonin. So the serotonin would go back into the presynaptic neuron to be recycled. So in this healthy individual, we can see that there is lots of serotonin available in the presynaptic neuron, in the synaptic cleft, and bound to all of the receptors. So there's lots of neurotransmission happening, and everything's all good. But in someone who has depression, this looks a little different. So there's significantly less serotonin available in the presynaptic neuron, in the synaptic cleft, and Again, there's not as much bound to the receptors. And so we're not getting as much neurotransmission, and that's why we're seeing symptoms of depression. So based on this theory, we've seen several different antidepressant medications developed that attempt to increase the concentration of monoamine neurotransmitters. So the most commonly prescribed antidepressant are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, and Prozac is a pretty common example. Um, so this class of antidepressants attempt to, or they selectively inhibit the presynaptic neurons reuptake of serotonin, which then increases the concentration in the synapse. So there are some side effects associated with this. However, they're significantly less severe than those seen with um, other types of antidepressants that are available. However, some of them are um, headache, nausea, restlessness, or um, insomnia. So when we go back to our model of our synapse, we can again see there's 
lots of serotonin available in someone who's healthy. Um, and then in someone who has depression, they're significantly less. But when this person would start taking an SSRI, the drug would block the reuptake transporter protein so that the serotonin is not able to go back into the presynaptic neuron. And so this would then increase the concentration, making their making there be more available to be bound by the receptors, and we get more neurotransmission happening. Um, so this might seem like it all works really well, but we actually see a few problems with antidepressants. So for starters, it takes a really long time for these current antidepressants to achieve their effects. So we see chemical changes in the concentration of monoamine neurotransmitters relatively quickly, like within a few hours. Um, but most people don't feel relief of their symptoms until about four to six weeks after having started taking it. And so this time discrepancy doesn't seem to align with the monoamine hypothesis then. If the concentration is increasing, then why aren't we seeing people relieve or have relief of their symptoms? Second, there are many individuals who don't respond at all to antidepressants. And so these non-responders are considered to have treatment-resistant depression when they don't respond to two or more antidepressant medications. And surprisingly, about one third to half of individuals with depression have treatment-resistant depression. So what this basically means is that current antidepressant medications are really not efficient nor effective. And this is especially concerning for individuals who experience suicidal ideation as one of their symptoms, um, just given the severity of the situation. So, Evidently, current antidepressants have a few issues, and yet, like I said, they're based off of what's the most widely accepted hypothesis of the pathophysiology of depression. So how do we fix this problem of ineffective and inefficient antidepressants? Well, the answer might lie in changing our understanding of the pathophysiology of depression to highlight new biological targets for new medications. So this brings me to an amino acid neurotransmitter called glutamate. So glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, which means that when it's released, it increases the likelihood that the postsynaptic neuron will become activated. And compared to monoamine neurotransmitters, glutamate is found in much higher concentrations in the brain and is found in 80% of neurons. So some researchers have deemed the brain to be a glutamate machine, so to speak. So for glutamate to function, it has several receptors to which it binds. Um, and there's two classes. There's ionotropic receptors and metabotropic receptors. And I'm only going to be talking about the ionotropic ones, which are responsible for fast signaling. So within this, there are three types of receptors. We have kinate. Um, alpha amino 3 hydroxy 4 isoxanthole propionic acid, or as I like to call them, AMPA receptors, um, and, and the last one is N methyl D aspartate, or NMDA receptors. So glutamate is involved in synaptic plasticity, learning, and memory. And synaptic plasticity just means that the synapses, so new synapses can develop, existing synapses can be lost and existing synapses can either increase or decrease in strength. Um, so this might look something like this. So here we have our presynaptic neuron in orange that releases glutamate such that it can bind to an AMPA receptor or an NMDA receptor. So when this happens, the AMPA receptor will allow sodium into the postsynaptic neuron which then depolarizes the cell. So then this depolarization will kick out the purple magnesium ion sitting in the NMDA receptor and allow calcium into the cell. So this would then excite the postsynaptic neuron um, and we would potentially be increasing this synapse or the strength of the synapse. However, this process can be dysregulated, which then leads to problems. Um, so this is where the glutamate hypothesis of depression comes into play. And unlike the monoamine hypothesis of depression, the glutamate theory doesn't have one exact mechanism, so to speak. Um, 
And that's just because there's less research done on it. But generally speaking, the dysregulation of glutamate signaling res resulting in reduced activity in certain brain regions is thought to be involved in the pathophysiology of depression. And like I said, the details of what exactly is happening that causes this dysregulation aren't very well understood, but there's generally scientific or agreement within the scientific community that glutamate is in some way or another involved in depression. So under this assumption, how do we target the glutamatergic system? Well, there are several drugs that target the NMDA receptor that have had promise for treating depression. And specifically, a drug called ketamine. Shocking. So um, ketamine is considered to be a proof of concept agent and that although, again, we don't know how glutamate is exactly involved, we know it probably is in some way. Because ketamine directly targets this receptor of the glutamatergic system and it happens to work quite well as an antidepressant. And so before going into more depth with this, let's talk a bit about ketamine's background. So ketamine was first available for human use in 1970 as a rapid acting dissociative anesthetic. So a dissociative anesthetic means that it does not induce complete unconsciousness, but rather uh, causes individuals not to be able to move or remember what's happened to them. Um, in addition to this, it's also used as an analgesic in hospitals to reduce chronic and acute post-operative pain as an alternative to opioids. Uh, so ketamine likely produces these effects by blocking the NMDA receptor. However, there are a few side effects associated with ketamine's use. And these side effects, depending on the dose, include hallucinations, dissociative effects, psychotomimetic effects, and feeling out-of-body experiences. So this makes ketamine actually attractive as a recreational drug for some people. Um, and this obviously causes problems for its potential use as an antidepressant, especially because ketamine has abuse potential. So um, if individuals abuse ketamine over extended periods of time, the drug can be reinforcing, which means that they're more likely to continue using it. And there's also tolerance effects observed. So this means that people have to increase the dose to feel the same effects that they once felt the first time that they took the drug. So despite these um, side effects, uh, ketamine also has these antidepressant effects. So the Berman lab first described ketamine's acute and sustained antidepressant effects in 2000. So they had a study of just seven participants where they found that a single intravenous uh, sub-anesthetic low dose of ketamine produced significant antidepressant effects for all participants. So the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, or the HDRS score, or scale, <laughs> is a questionnaire that's commonly used as an indication of depression. And so Berman in his lab um, measured the change in participants' HDRS scores to show that ketamine reduced these symptoms. And as you can see, there was a significant difference in this change in score at about uh, four hours. And then this, these effects lasted until three days, at which point participants reported feeling um, back at their baseline mood. So this demonstrates ketamine's uh, acute and sustained antidepressant effects. And because of this, ketamine has been deemed the greatest discovery for treating depression in 60 years, which is the time at which the first antidepressant was discovered. So ketamine definitely has beneficial antidepressant effects. But like I said, there are potential problems. And so it begs the question of whether we can really use ketamine as an antidepressant. And the answer to this question, um, or to answer the question, we need to better understand exactly how ketamine is producing its effects. So understanding ketamine's mode of action might allow us to eliminate its side effects or to find other drugs that work through the same biological target as ketamine, but that don't have the same side effects. So the most widely researched and assumed mode of action for ketamine's antidepressant effects is through the NMDA receptor. So we know that ketamine binds to the NMDA receptor, and we also know that glutamate does, but there's actually several molecules that do so. So here is NMDA, which is a synthetic amino acid 
that was used to distinguish between the ionotropic receptors, and it's not actually found in the human body, but it does bind to the NMDA receptor. And then we have glutamate, which is the amino acid neurotransmitter that binds to the receptor. Um, and down on the bottom, we have phencyclidine or PCP, which is a hallucinogenic, just like ketamine. And so if you first glance at these molecules, they don't really look that similar. These two kind of look similar, these two kind of look similar, but when you compare them all, not really. So how do all of these different molecules bind to the same receptor? Well, it turns out that NMDA and glutamate are agonists. And so, so they both bind in a location that would activate the receptor to open up and produce this biological response. And then on the other hand, PCP and ketamine are non-competitive antagonists, which means that they bind in a different location to inhibit the receptor from becoming activated. So this is how it might appear in a very simplified version of the NMDA receptor. So we need glutamate to bind to the receptor for it to become activated. So we have glutamate. But it's a little more complicated because glutamate requires a coagonist. So in the current state, the, this receptor would not become activated because glutamate is the only thing present. So we need either glycine or deserine to come in and bind to the receptor as well for it to be activated. But there's more. <laughs> so there's this magnesium ion that sits in the middle here that needs to be removed. And I kind of alluded to this in an earlier slide, but for this to happen, the cell that the receptor sits on needs to become depolarized. So if you consider a neuron with an AMPA receptor and an NMDA receptor on it, if the AMPA receptor becomes activated and allows sodium into the cell, it will depolarize the cell, which then kicks out the magnesium ion of the nearby NMDA receptor. So now the cell is fully, or the receptor is fully activated and can allow ions to pass through. However, this stops when we have an antagonist binding um, in this location, such as PCP or ketamine. So now that we have this basic understanding of the NMDA receptor, we can take a look at a potential mode of action for ketamine through the NMDA receptor. So here's a figure from a 2020 paper by CL et al. Um, and there are a few different hypotheses as to how ketamine might produce its effects through the NMDA receptor, but I'm only gonna be talking about two. So the first one starts with ketamine binding to the synaptic NMDA receptors. So when ketamine binds inside the channel, it prevents an influx of calcium through the NMDA receptor. And this prevents downstream signaling pathways that are dependent on calcium. So specifically, Ketamine inhibits a protein called eukaryotic elongation factor 2 kinase. So kinase is an enzyme that catalyzes the addition of a phosphate group, seen here, um, onto another molecule. So when this kinase is deactivated, there's no phosphorylation of another protein called eukaryotic elongation factor 2, or EEF2. So without the addition of this phosphate group, EEF2 is activated. And this protein is involved in protein synthesis. Um, so activating it via the inhibition of this kinase allows rapid synthesis of another protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And BDNF is essential for nerve growth and synaptic plasticity. So by increasing the production of BDNF, you're increasing the growth of neurons. And this increase in neuron growth is thought to be responsible for ketamine's antidepressant effects. And we can see the importance of BDNF in this um, next hypothesis as well. So this next hypothesis focuses on NMD receptors that are located outside of the synaptic cleft um, rather than the synaptic cleft itself. So one possibility of how glutamate might be involved in depression is that when it binds to these NMD receptors outside of the synapse, it causes an, a detrimental increase in the amount of calcium that's inside the cell. So normally when calcium enters through these cells, these extrasynaptic receptors, it triggers the removal of a phosphate group from a protein called the CREB. And CREB is involved in transcription. So by removing the phosphate group, the protein is inactivated. And with CREB inactivated, 
transcription is turned off, and BDNF expression is suppressed. So when ketamine binds to this receptor, it blocks the channel and prevents any calcium from entering the cell. So this means that CREB remains phosphorylated and in its active form, which then allows transcription and BDNF expression. So like I mentioned, BDNF is essential for nerve um, growth. And so from these hypotheses, as well as other literature that I've read, um, neuron growth is probably reduced in a depressed state because of dysregulated glutamate function. And so by increasing BDNF, we might then be relieving the symptoms of depression. So although NMDA antagonism seems to explain ketamine's antidepressant effects, there is a complicating factor. And that's because ketamine is a chiral drug. So what does chiral mean? Well, when a chemical compound is said to be chiral, it means that the compound itself and its mirror image are not superimposable. So how do we know if a compound is chiral? We look for what's called the chiral center which has four different attachments um, that then make the atom asymmetric. So here's ketamine, and if we look at this carbon here, we can see that there's four different attachments. So we have a benzene ring, a nitrogen, a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen, and a carbon with two hydrogens coming off. So we know that ketamine has a chiral center, and thus it's chiral. So this means that ketamine has two enantiomers. So a good way of explaining enantiomers is if you look at your hands and you put your hands palm face down and then put your left hand on top of your right hand, they don't line up and so they're not, they're not superimposable. So the same thing is said of R-ketamine and S-ketamine. If you were to put S-ketamine on top of R-ketamine, they wouldn't, they wouldn't match up, so they're not superimposable. So why am I even telling you about this? Why is this important? Well, um, when compounds are chiral, the two enantiomers can act as two completely different drugs and act pharmacologically differently. So this means that each enantiomer has differences in its dose and efficacy. So basically how much or how little is needed to produce the desired therapeutic effect. Um, there's also differences in affinity and selectivity. So one enantiomer might bind better to the target, which would then increase the efficacy. There could be differences in side effects. So one enantiomer might produce the therapeutic effect while the other could cause the undesirable side effects. And lastly, enantiomers could be metabolized differently. So they could be excreted and, or metabolized <laughs> by separate pathways or remain in the body for different amounts of time in an active form. So these are all important to consider when looking into drug design. And so we obviously need to take this into account when we're looking at ketamine as a potential antidepressant. And luckily, several research groups have begun to determine the differences between R-ketamine and S-ketamine. So it's pretty well known that R-ketamine has a three to four fold lower affinity for the NMDA receptor. So this means that it doesn't bind as tightly to the receptor and is more easily kicked out. But more recent research suggests that R-ketamine has more potent and long-lasting antidepressant effects with fewer psychonomimetic effects compared to S-ketamine. And I'll go a bit more in depth about that later on. Um, however, there's a lot less research done on R-ketamine compared to S-ketamine. And this is because R-ketamine has this lower affinity for the NMD receptor. So like I said earlier, the assumed mode of action for ketamine's antidepressant effects is through the NMDA receptor, and because our ketamine doesn't bind as well there, um, not as much research has been devoted to looking at our ketamine. So on the other hand, we have S-ketamine, which has a higher affinity for the NMDA receptor, but might actually have less potent antidepressant effects and have more psychotomimetic effects. However, there's so much more research done on S-ketamine that there's actually an FDA approved drug called Spravato. So even though this drug exists on the market, we can take a look at some research that actually might suggest r is more suitable. So this is from a study by Chang et al. in 2019. So in this study, they used a chronic social defeat stress model of depression in rats, which basically just means they stressed the rats to a point where they exhibit behaviors that mimic symptoms of depression in humans. 
And so the rats who were exposed to stress are in this susceptible condition. So these susceptible rats were either administered um, S-ketamine, R-ketamine, or what's called the racemic mixture, which means that there is half and half of R and half, and, uh, half of S in the mixture, or they were given saline. Um, and then the susceptible rats were compared to a control group. So next, behavioral tests were used to determine ketamine's effects. And these happened at two days post-ketamine injection and seven days post-ketamine injection. So the sucrose preference test seen here is um, pretty common. And so in this test, um, normally rats will prefer sucrose water over regular water, and rats that are stressed will prefer they don't prefer sucrose water over regular water. So if we look at the two days post-ketamine injection, we can see that, um, or, so we can see the differences between the control rats and the saline rats. Um, there's a significant difference in that the control rats preferred the sucrose water more. Um, and then if we look at the rats that were given the drug, we can see that all the R-ketamine, S-ketamine, and racemic ketamine all significantly increase the rat's preference for the sucrose. But when we look at seven days post-ketamine injection, we can see that only R-ketamine increased it significantly. And this is compared to S-ketamine, which really barely did anything. So from Chang et al's study, as well as several others, research suggests that R-ketamine might have a higher antidepressant potency um, than S-ketamine. So what about the safety? So this is from a 2015 study by Yang and Al, and they used a behavioral test called the Condition Place Preference Test. Um, so this test is commonly used in determining rewarding effects of drugs. So it means that if a drug is more rewarding, then the mice will want more of it. So the CPP score seen on the y-axis here is the time that a mouse spent in a drug conditioning site minus the time spent in a saline conditioning site. So a higher score means that the mouse spent more time in a site that had previously that they had previously been given the drug. So this means that the drug was more rewarding. So if we look at our ketamine here in the middle, you can see that no matter what the dose was, the CPP score didn't really change all that much. But when we look at S ketamine, as the dose increased, the CPP score also increased. And so this suggests that S-ketamine might be more, have more rewarding effects, which then suggests that it has um, a higher abuse potential. Uh, so another study by Tian et al. in 2018 wanted to determine whether the racemic, R-ketamine, and S-ketamine could induce expression of heat shock protein 70. So heat shock protein 70 is a protein that's not normally expressed in the brain under normal conditions but it is upon insults such as heat shock, which is increased temperature, or prolonged seizures. And so this protein is then a good marker for neuronal damage. So here we can see these dark bands in the S-ketamine sample, but we are not seeing any in the R-ketamine sample. And so this suggests that S-ketamine is producing more neuronal damage than R-ketamine. So from Tan and L study and Yang and L study, we can see that S-ketamine might have more detrimental side effects than R-ketamine. So due to ketamine's psychotomimetic effects, research has turned to other NMDA antagonists to see if they produce the same antidepressant effects. So studies have looked at compounds such as nemantine, uh, lanosamine, and traxoprodol, and these studies find that these NMDA antagonists don't produce antidepressant effects to the same extent as ketamine, and when they do, it's with less consistency across studies. So if NMDA antagonism is what produces ketamine's antidepressant effects, then other NMDA antagonists should theoretically produce the same effects, but we're not seeing that. So it suggests that NMDA is probably very likely involved, but there might be something else going on um, that ketamine targets to produce its effects. So, like I just said, we know that ketamine probably blocks the NMDA receptor, but we have a few unresolved questions. So first, there are several possible mechanisms through the NMDA receptor, and that we don't really know which one is right. Second, our ketamine seems to be a 
better antidepressant because it has these more potent and long-lasting effects with fewer side effects than esketamine, and yet it has a lower affinity for the receptor. So how is it producing these effects if it doesn't bind as well to the receptor? And lastly, we have other NMDA antagonists that don't work as well. So as I alluded to, um, it begs the question of whether or not there are other targets of ketamine. And the answer to that is probably yes. That in addition to uh, our NMDA antagonism, there are other systems involved. So for example, there's a lot of research on the opioid system as well as a protein called mammalian target of rapamycin. And I don't have time to talk about these um, in today's talk, but it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so where does this leave us, leave us with ketamine's use as an antidepressant? Well, ketamine certainly has potential to help a lot of people who are suffering from depression. And that's because of its quick and sustained antidepressant effects, whereas current antidepressants really don't have that. However, we really need more research on both the mechanism of action and its enantiomers. So we need to better understand the differences between enantiomers and how they work, or if they work through separate pathways, to see really what's happening. So it might be beneficial if we look at um, studies in humans rather than rats <laughs> to look at some of the differences between the enantiomers and then taking some of that information when we're trying to find the mechanism of action for ketamine. And once we know this information, we can find possible alternatives that will target the same um, things that ketamine targets to produce its antidepressant effects, but that don't produce those side effects. So overall, doing more research um, about ketamine is a step in the right direction to helping a lot more people who suffer from depression because of its uh, sustained and rapid antidepressant effects. And here are some references I used throughout the presentation. And I just want to give a few thank yous to Stefan, who's helped me a lot throughout the past year with keeping me on the right track with my literature search, um, Deanna Donahue for helping with the ChemSum classes and the Capstone class, and Lynette Ramos, who helped me a lot with the NMDA receptor, and friends and family for listening to me talk about ketamine, and of course, librarians and interlibrary loans um, for helping me find a lot of literature about the subject. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Hallie. Um, so as we do questions here, you can raise your hand physically, you can raise your hand in on, um, like raise your hand in the list, or you can chat it, or you can just speak up if I don't find you. So any questions? Go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, so um, I was wondering about that study, like the seven person study back in 2000. I was wondering if they did like a follow-up study to see if there was like any negative withdrawal effects of the ketamine or if they kind of just, you know, didn't check on them. Um, that particular group didn't do a follow-up study. And I actually haven't uh, found a whole lot of literature that looks at more the more long-term effects of ketamine. Um, so generally when people have done these studies, they found that people that when they give ketamine to participants in their studies, um, the psychotomimetic effects subside within two hours after having received it. But past that, there's not a whole lot of literature, at least that I've been able to read or find, um, that discusses the long-term effects. Um, but that's definitely something to be concerned about. So, yeah. Other questions? Sure. Um, so, did we, when you in your uh, extensive reading of this literature, did you see anything that looked like a crystal structure of the the drug in the um, NMDA receptor, or is there not really uh, any crystal structures for it? I saw one image of that. Yes, but but it's, it's hard to take a look at that and see. You know, try to gauge why one enantiomer would fit in that space oh. over another, I would guess. Yeah, I didn't particularly find anything that talked or specifically discussed the, like, the binding 
or how the different enantiomers are binding in the receptor. They're really just more looking at the like behavioral effects that they produce and the differences um, in that. Sure. Did they, did you get a sense of people looking at the metabolites of of the ketamine? Can you talk a little bit about yes. that? Yes. Yes. They. I believe one metabolite of the R enantiomer has shown um, to, has been shown to have a lot of antidepressant effects without the psychotomimetic effects. And then if I remember correctly, there's a different metabolite of the S enantiomer that might also produce antidepressant effects, but without the psychotomimetic effects. And so there's definitely been a lot of more literature on the metabolites as well. So, yeah. Sure. These, these amines, uh, psychoactive amines, can give lots of different kinds of metabolites that themselves are usually psychoactive too. So, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I guess I will ask a I ask a procedural question before in the previous talks. I'm going to ask a more like experiential question here. I think you did this project. It's a really big literature search, right? And I guess um, from doing a search where you can find out how deep you can dive and how much information each of these topics have, um, do you have any advice for organizing those thoughts or kind of what did you learn from doing diving so deep into the literature over this? 680 project? Well, I would say there were times during this project where there, I had so much information that I had read that I was very overwhelmed and I like didn't know where, how I was going to organize my thoughts. Um, and that's partly because when I was doing this literature search, there's so many topics where they have not conflicting, but what well, kind of conflicting? There are some studies that report one thing, and then there are other studies that report a total, like, totally opposite thing. And so you really have to kind of boil down what what it says. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. If, if I can jump in here, like I think one thing that one strategy that she took that I think worked out pretty well is that she sought out someone. She did not seek out an expert. She sought out someone that knew like about a day's worth more than she did, which is myself. Yes. Right? So, <laughs> you know, that way there, there, there wasn't that sort of like disconnect where you're worried about like, you know, kind of like asking the wrong question or just feeling totally lost, right? And, yeah. and she and I, you know, she, she thanked uh, Dr. Ramos at, at the end there. Like she and I kind of game planned like, all right, at which point do we have our questions in good enough shape where we are okay going to the expert? Uh, which, <laughs> which I think is a, good, it's a really good strategy, right? Because anything you can do, you know, to like work yourself up to like getting to the question that you need to ask the expert is, is useful. So I encourage yeah. all of you listening to, you know, don't feel like you have to go to the world leader first. Like talk to someone that seems like they know like 10% more about it and that can point you in some direction. Yes. And I think that that's how innovation is made, is that somebody from a whole different field goes, oh, they said something like that, and you gotta dig in and figure out everything that's in there. And so it's just a really good example of how research is done. So I wanted you to share that overwhelmed experience because I had no doubt you got there and <laughs> you just plow through somehow. Um, any but then other? when you had that talk with, when you had that talk with Lynette, it was like, oh my gosh, like the sky is open and you could get something. Yeah, it was. Cool. Yeah. It was great. Any other questions or are we feeling good? Well, I would like to thank Hallie again for just such a wonderful talk. I hope that I have the opportunity to see you all again at one of the next 10 CD experience talks that we're going to have. Um, and I will continue to inform them. If you wanna hang out and ask Callie any questions here at the end, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I will see you when I see you or not at all, I guess. Great job, Callie. Thanks. Bye everybody. <laughs>